Okay, now we start chapter 21, and then the first topic we're going to hit is called the molecular model of an ideal gas, and I'll talk about the theory, then I'll do uh, some examples uh, with that. So what we're going to try to derive here is an equation between the pressure volume of a gas and uh, the temperature of the gas and also the kinetic energy of the gas, right? So we start out with a, an idealized box of uh, it's a cubical box d d and then let's say all the dimensions are the same but then once we derive an answer then it will be applicable to any kind of a box right so we have here the width is the d the height is d and then the the length is d right everything is d so we're assuming here then that uh molecules are coming and bumping into the uh, one side of the gas here this way and then bouncing back so it has a certain initial velocity, right? And we want to approximate what the average force that the molecule applies on one side of the box, and then therefore that uh, side of the box applies back on the molecule. So the interactive, mutual interactive forces between the, that particle and the box, right? So uh, we're gonna apply the impulse, J is equal to the force times uh, DT, right? So the, the particle is going to come and bounce back, and then this is going to equal to the change in momentum, P final minus the P initial of the molecule, right? So um, this will give you the instantaneous force that the wall applies on the particle, right? F dt. Okay? But the component of the momentum that is changing is the x component, right? What's happening here is that you have here V initial, then V initial, but the initial velocity is, uh, we can break it down into two components. We can say here V initial X, and then V initial Y, and then we can break this up into V final Y, and then V final X, right? The final velocity in the Y direction, V final Y, does not change because it's almost like the particle sort of just glides along the side of the box, and therefore its y component doesn't change. But the x component experiences a complete reflection, right? It's coming this way, then the final velocity is that way. So we can say here, p final is mv final x minus mv initial x, right? But the final x and the initial x are actually going to be the same, uh, okay? It's going to just simply bounce back. It's a perfectly elastic collision. We're assuming there's no absorption by the side of the boxes, right? So we have here F dt is equal to M uh, V final X minus, and then V initial X is equal to negative V final X, right? So initial velocity is just simply the negative of the final velocity. So then that's going to equal to what? Uh, 2 M V final X, right? This gives you the instantaneous force. So if I knew the time of interaction of the particle with that side of the box, I would be able to calculate the instantaneous force. But now, how about the average force? In other words, this particle is now gonna bounce, go back and bounce over here and then come back, right? And then hit that same box. So it might do something like this, like this, and then come back and hit that same box. What's the average force during the time that it takes for the particle to go and then come back? So uh, um, the average force over that total time interval. So we can say, force average times big delta T, 2mv final x, right? Uh, or we could just write this as vx, because the, the, v, the x component of the velocity is not changing. So what is the time that it takes for the particle to go and then come back and hit that same side of the box, right? So the time delta T is going to be twice the distance of the box divided by the x component of the velocity, vx, right? Then I put that here, average force 2d over vx is equal to 2mvx, right? And then we can say here the 2's cancel, and then I have the average force is equal to, uh, we have mvx squared over uh, d, right? If I want to do the, uh, the average force on all n particles, I would have to add up sum of i equals 1 through n dx squared over d. In other words, I would have to take each particle's velocity in the x component, 
I would have to square that and I would have to add them up because not all particles are moving at the same velocity, right? So uh, square the velocity of each particle in the x direction and then add up all the particles' velocities in the x direction from i equals 1 through n. That would give me the average force on all n particles, right? Now I'm going to express this like this. I'm going to say vx squared average is equal to 1 over n sum of i equals 1 through n vx squared Right? So if I take all the n particles and I say vx squared uh, plus vx squared plus vx squared, right? And then I divide that by n, that's going to give me the average uh, vx squared. In other words, this quantity here, vx squared average, is the average of all the vx squared added up divided over the n particles, right? x squared is going to equal n vx squared average, right? So then I can rewrite this like this. Average force is equal to m n vx squared average. So the average sign, sign should be over the vx squared, right? And then you divide that by d. Then we're going to argue this. We're going to say vx squared average plus vy squared average plus vz squared average is equal to v squared average. Because uh, this, model, this uh, gas we're going to assume is isotropic, so no uh, direction is preferred. That means the molecules in, uh, are moving just as much in the x direction as the y direction and also in the z direction. So their, uh, their average value of the velocity in, uh, squared in the x direction plus the average value of the velocity squared in the y plus average value of the velocity squared in the z should equal to the average of the total velocity squared of the molecules, right? Therefore, Vx squared, uh, we're going to assume, is equal to Vy squared average, which is equal to Vz squared average, right? That all three of them are equal. Well, if all three of them are equal, then we're going to say v, uh, 3 times Vx squared average is equal to V squared average, and therefore Vx squared average is one-third V squared average, right? So in other words, the x component of the velocity squared is just simply one-third of the total velocity of the particles squared average, right? So then we can have here average force is m n one-third v squared average over d, right? Then I can divide this, express the, the average pressure on one wall of the gas, right? Average pressure is equal to force divided by area, and then the average force, and then the area of the wall was d squared, right? Because remember, we assumed the wall was cubic, so all the sides were d. Then you divide this by d squared, you're going to get m n one-third v squared average over d cubed, right? Well, d cubed is actually the volume of the gas, right? m n one-third v squared average over volume. So we can say pressure times volume is equal to m n one-third v squared average. Right? But now I'm going to be relating this to the kinetic energy of the gas, right? The kinetic energy of the particle, right, kinetic energy is equal to, for each particle is half m v squared average, right? So if you take the square of the velocity of a particle and you average it out and multiply it by its mass, and half of that, that's equal to the kinetic energy. So then I'm going to say m v squared average, which you see here, m v squared, so mv squared average is equal to 2 times kinetic energy, right? So then I can write this uh, law like this. Pv is equal to, so n you already have over 3, and then v squared is going to be equal to 2 times the kinetic energy, right? I can relate this to the ideal gas law, and I can say ideal gas law says that Pv is equal to nkt, right? Pressure times volume is the number of particles times k times t. So we have here nkt is equal to n two-thirds kinetic energy, and then the n and the n cancel, and then we have uh, proven the equation kinetic energy is equal to three halves uh, kt, right? So the kinetic energy of each particle is equal to three halves times the k times the temperature. So that means we have proven a very fundamental equation in thermodynamics. It turns out that for each degree of freedom, for each degree of freedom, the kinetic energy of a particle is half times K times temperature. 
right? In our molecule, we were assuming that uh, the degrees of freedom are three. In other words, the molecule is just a simple molecule particle, and the only thing that it can do is translate in the x direction, translate in the y direction, and translate in the z direction, right? So x, y, z. So the kinetic energy that it had was only half mv x squared, half mv y squared, half mv z squared, right? Later, when we add more degrees of freedom, maybe it's a double mo molecule that it can rotate, or it could even vibrate, right? It can vibrate. So when we add more degrees of freedom, then the kinetic energy, we're gonna be adding every time one half kT, one half kT, right? So in our case, since we have three degrees of freedom, the kinetic energy of our gas came out to be equal to three halves kT, right? So this is a fundamental equation of thermodynamics that is a very, very crucial result, okay? So then from there, we can also express the root mean square velocity. We can say kinetic energy is equal to one half V squared average is equal to 3 halves kT, 2, 2 cancel, and we can say V squared average is equal to 3 kT over M, right? Now we can define something very important known as the root mean square. V root mean square is equal to the square root of V squared average. This is the definition. The root mean square velocity is the square root of the average of the, the square of the velocities, right? So you're squaring the velocity of each particle and you're finding the average of all those squares of the particles, then you're square rooting it. And then that's gonna equal square root of three kT over M, right? This is the root mean square uh, velocity of a gas in a container, right? Very, very important result. But a lot of times we don't know the mass of a particle of the gas, we know it's molar mass, right? So how can we write that so that we don't have to always use the mass of the particle of the gas? So let's show you how to do that. Remember we have PV is equal to NKT, which equals to NRT, right? So if I have a K over M, well, we also can use the relationship between Avogadro's number and the number of moles and the particles, right? N is the number of particles, okay? Which is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's number, which tells you particles per mole, right? And then mole and mole cancel, right? So this is an important relationship that you can use whenever you're trying to relate the number of particles to the number of moles, you relate it via Avogadro's number. N is equal to N and A, right? So I can say here, number of moles times Avogadro's number, right? And then the N and the N cancel, and I have R over M and A. Well, what is this? This is the grams per particle, right? M is grams per particle. And then this uh, Avogadro's number is what? Particles per mole. Particles per mole. Okay, so then what happens? Well, the particle cancel here, right? And then this tells you what? Grams per mole. What is that? That is known as the molar mass. So how, uh, how many grams is one mole of that particle, right? So this is uh, known as a capital M. That is usually more useful because it's usually written on the periodic table, right? For helium, helium's uh, molar mass is four grams. For a carbon, it is 12 grams. For oxygen, it is 16 grams, and so on and so forth. Okay, so then in my root mean square velocity equation, the final result is this. V root mean square is equal to square root of three kT over M. But the easier version of that is to write it as three. I just showed you that K over M is R over big M. So then I can just say R T over big M. So here you're using the Boltzmann's constant divided by the mass of one particle here you, you're using the gas constant and then you're dividing by the molar mass, so it's easier. And the other equation that I had just proven was that the kinetic energy of one molecule or one particle of the gas was three halves kT, right? This is the kinetic energy per molecule. Now if I want to find the kinetic energy of all N molecules, so then I can multiply this by N. So this is for one particle or one molecule. Then I can multiply this by the number of particles, N kT. And then remember, nkt is also equal to little nrt. So we have here 
3 halves n r t. Okay? And then to finalize it, we have PB is equal to n r t, which is equal to n k t. Right? So if the kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves n k t, and then I can say n k t is PB. Right? So then that brings us back to the, uh, the equation that we proved pressure times volume is equal to 2 kinetic energy divided by 3. So this basically board summarizes uh, all the equations that we've proven so far, the root mean square velocity definition, the kinetic energy per particle, the total kinetic energy, the ideal gas, and then the relationship between pressure, volume, and, um, and kinetic energy. Okay. Next, I'll do an example utilizing these equations. Thank you.